gonna be late. Hello, and welcome to Film Rant. A lot of you probably think this is a rather niche film for me to cover because, well, I'm a Hollywood whore. There's no secrets about that. But I am also a Green Day whore. I have been for the past 12 years, and my love for them has never wavered, even during the trilogy phase of 2012, which saw them release their most uninspired music ever. But we're not here to talk about Green Day. We are here to talk about Green Day frontman Billy Joe Armstrong's debut acting film, Ordinary World, directed by Lee Kirk, who is a guy I have an unhealthy vendetta against because he's married to Jenna Fisher, aka the smoking hot Pam Beasley from The Office, and he's got to make a movie with my musical idol. Basically, this guy has everything I've ever wanted out of life, and I should really try and befriend him. Then take everything he ever loved from him and stamp his bones and ashes and... Anyway, this 21st century breakdown of the movie will contain spoilers, so don't continue watching if you're a basket case about that sort of thing. So let's talk about the elephant in the room here. This is a movie whose lead is the lead singer of Green Day. The movie itself is basically a depiction of this statement from Billy Joe Armstrong himself. You know, music to me is, um... It's the air that I breathe, you know? It's the blood that pumps through my veins that keeps me alive. So without it, I don't know what I, I don't know what I would do. I mean, I probably have a job or something like that, but people ask me, what would you do if you didn't have Green Day? And I said, what, I, I'd be in Green Day. I don't really know anything else. It's about a washed up old rock star who falls victim to life itself and the responsibilities of marriage and parenthood. Now, to cast Billy Joe Armstrong in that role you'd think would give the film some element of plausibility, when I think it actually mostly harms the movie more than helps it. Sure, Billy Joe definitely nails the old rocker vibe, as he actually is one. His character is very believable in the sense that you get where his roots lie and what his main passions are. However, the whole reason Perry falls out of music is because he leaves the band when he had a kid. Okay, that's a believable reason to let go of your dreams if you aren't getting anywhere. But Perry does this when the band have a record deal, so then the reason becomes that he found it too hard to manage both the band and the kid at the same time, which is also very believable. However, because they cast Billy Joe Armstrong, this motivation feels a little unbelievable, mainly because Billy Joe himself has remained one of the world's biggest rock stars and basically continued to improve his career after he got married and had kids. He was basically married in 1994 and had his first kid in 95. That's just one and two years after Green Day's biggest album, Dookie, was released. They released the following album, Insomniac, in 1995, the same year he had a kid. So to cast him in a movie where his character leaves the band on the verge of success because of having a kid feels a bit wrong in a sense. That being said, there's absolutely no doubt that the main draw to this movie is Billy Joe Armstrong. I can guarantee that I wouldn't have watched it if my boy wasn't in it. As for his performance, he was okay. He was never cringy bad, looking at you Tommy Whistle, but there was certainly the odd poorly delivered line here and there. Some of his reactions were a little off too. For some reason he's overwhelmingly camp at times too, like he runs in a really strange way. I mean look at this. That group is kind of hurt. <laughs> we just messing with you. There it goes. It doesn't really make the film any worse, but you have to admit it's awkward to look at. I think with some more experience, Billy could maybe be a decent actor, but I don't think he'll be adding an Oscar to his various Grammys anytime soon. There's only a handful of other characters in the movie who are worth talking about, so I'll be brief. Gary is Billy Joe Armstrong's character Perry's best friend, or at least Perry thinks he is, and he's an old bandmate from back in the day. Perry wants to try and rekindle the old flame he had inside him by having a blowout party, so he invites Gary to the party. Turns out, Gary's a bit of a dick. I mean, he sort of does what Perry wanted, he does give him a kick-ass party, but at the expense of Perry's wallet and the kicker, he basically tells Perry the band is still together, but they kicked him out without him knowing. Gary humiliates Perry in front of a lot of people, and he's basically an all-round douche. However, I think this is intentional, as it allows Perry to see that he just doesn't want to be that kind of guy anymore, which I guess makes sense. Another character is Christy, which I think could possibly be in reference to the song Christy Road, but maybe that's just my fanboyism coming out there. Christy's an old flame of Perry and clearly still wants the D. She's a bit of a bitch in that she knows he's married but still tries to get jiggy with it, but other than that she seems alright. She seems to only exist in the movie to flirt with Perry now and then, usher in a Joan Jett cameo, and then be the only character that believes in his musical dream. After all, she's the only person in the whole movie Perry plays a new song to. She lacks depth, but I guess this movie is all about Perry, so it's understandable that the supporting characters have no depth. The movie would definitely have been better off, though, if the supporting characters had a little bit more about them. To be honest, the same goes for Perry's wife and kid, the dad group who are trying to recruit him, and his brother. Everyone except Perry is pretty two-dimensional. I mean, his wife is called, um... What's her name? 
I'm not just saying that for a Green Day pun, by the way, I legitimately don't have a clue what it's called. The only character who had some promise was his kid, but she isn't in the movie enough for Lee Kirk to really show us who she is and explore her character. And I think that's mainly down to the movie having the completely wrong plot. How can a movie have the wrong plot, I hear you say? A plot can be about whatever it wants, and a movie can be about whatever it wants. That's absolutely true, if you want to make a movie about Hitler hijacking Space Mountain and forming a new Third Reich out of Disneyland employees, then you will within your right to do that. But ultimately, a plot has to be engaging and interesting enough to warrant the story being told. Sometimes a plot can be so overtly intricate and complex to create an engaging story, like The Matrix for example, or a plot can be delightfully simple and use the film itself to give the plot deeper meaning and engagement, like Hell or High Water, which is a fucking awesome movie by the way, go and see it when you can. Where Ordinary World fails is in its structure and plot beats. The movie is about an aging ex-rock star who wants to try and get back into his old ways and relive the dream of being a rock star. I think to really explain what he's missing, we needed to see much more of him in his heyday. All we see is him playing one song with his band to a small crowd in a bar at the very start of the movie. We then see a small snippet of an interview where Perry and his bandmates are given some silly answers. I feel like the opening 20 minutes or so of the movie should have been some kind of montage mixed with full scenes that really fleshed out the story of his band. It should have shown the band growing, getting their record deal, putting out the record and doing shows. Not necessarily becoming as famous as Green Day, but more along the lines of bands like Lost Alone or Fight Star. Bands that have moderate success, but not people you'd necessarily recognise in the street. That would have allowed us to see what Perry misses much more clearly. It would have also allowed the movie to explore Perry overcoming the idea of not being famous anymore. Instead, the movie opts to just go for the path not taken route, where Perry regrets leaving the band. That plot strand is fine, but it just lacks the punch that I think the other plotline would give. In terms of plot beats, the movie just seems to lose its way in places, and it's not incredibly clear why Perry finally accepts his life. It's something to do with not wanting to be like Gary anymore, being too old for this shit, and just growing out of his old ways. There's a section in the middle where you think Perry is finally going to get to play again with his band in front of a few friends and random strangers. Instead, he's kicked out of the band and forced to watch, and as a result, acts out in rage and smashes his daughter's guitar. This is the scene that pushes him over the edge. While it works in some sense, I think I would have liked to have seen Perry play with his band and rekindle that old passion. It's what I wanted to see for the entire movie, I wanted to see him finally get the chance to relive some youth. I would have had him play the music, feel a little worn out by all of it, then like a kid in a sweet shop, ask the guys if they want to get back together. They tell him that they just don't have the time, they have families and such, and Perry is simply forced to just let the dream go. Maybe Gary tells him to focus on his kids, as having kids basically makes you throw everything into them. Parenthood often makes people lose their independence, so they put their hobbies into their children and try and get their children to do what they do. This could have been a much stronger catalyst for Perry living on through his kids than what's in the actual movie. Of course this plot strand doesn't fit Gary's character at all, it need to be tweaked somewhat. Ultimately, I think the whole movie is about overcoming youth, which seems to be a theme with Billy Joe himself these days. A song on the new album Revolution Radio is called Outlaws, which is a song in which Billy Joe reminisces about the time he and Mike Durnt used to cause trouble in their neighbourhood as kids. It's a spiritual successor to Christy Road, which is also a song reminiscing about when they were teenagers, and is also the song which I think inspired the character of Christy. After all, she's the only character that wants Perry to go back to his roots and go for his dream. She's a part of his youth, and she wants to encourage him to return to it. There is some nice subtleties to the plot, like how the group of dads trying to recruit Perry into their dad group is basically Perry's new band. They want him to leave his old band and join them to do dad things like poker night and such. That's nice, I like that. There was also some very nice scenes which I'll get onto soon, but I just think overall the plot should have been reworked and rewritten to tell a much more compelling narrative. There's a good film on Ordinary World's plot somewhere, but this movie is like the demo version of it. As I just mentioned, there are a few good scenes in the movie which are well written, well directed and well acted. The first is a scene where Perry and Christy are lying on a bed together and he's telling her about how he poured his heart and soul into music and didn't really get anywhere. He basically explains to her his midlife crisis he's having and she listens, which you get the impression is something his wife doesn't do. Christy supports him and feels genuinely excited when he offers to play her a new song he's written. Christy then takes this situation to try and put the moves on Perry, which is an absolute dick move since the guy's married, and this scene could so very easily have destroyed the entire film had Perry kissed her back. It could have filled it off as one of those moments where he's having the worst day ever, you know, his wife forgot his birthday, he's had a midlife crisis, and he just thinks, fuck it, let's nail this chick. I was happy that this scene didn't take that route. Perry tells her that he can't and then gets out of the situation by offering to play her his song. Another touching scene comes at the end where Perry finally accepts his new adult life. His wife is cuddling up with him on the sofa and she basically just says to him, Can you believe that we're parents? Us? When our kids go away to college and they think of home, they'll think of us. 
Then she asks Perry if he wants to watch House Hunters and get it on. Which sounds like a throwaway line, but it's actually set up quite nicely earlier on in the movie where Perry describes what a wild night he had watching House Hunters. It was sweet. It did make me tear up or anything, but I enjoyed it. Good work, Mr. Kirk. There was another really nice scene about three quarters of the way through where Perry finally makes it to his daughter's talent show, not unlike the ending to Anchorman 2. As she gets on stage, she introduces the song she's going to play and says, This is a song my dad taught me. I think because it's about him. She then goes on to sing a song which I think is called Unsatisfied. It's a bit on the nose, but it sounds like something an old musician would do if they were pissed off. They'd write a song like that. It's touching to see Perry watch his daughter perform the song. You can see he's sort of watching and sort of not. He's re-evaluating everything. I liked it. This is actually a scene where I think Billy Joe acts brilliantly. His expression when watching the kids speaks volumes. However, what I think would have been better is if she played Ordinary World. Perry tells Christy that he wrote Ordinary World and he's demoing the song to her to see what she thinks of it. I think it would have been great if his daughter came out and said, I wrote this song myself and it's just about life or something like that, I'm no writer, and then played the song. That way, it would have been really cool to see that Perry is already starting to live through his kids. He would have played her song to Christy and got her opinion on it to see if his daughter is making music people would like. You can also look at it in the sense that Perry is stealing his daughter's work because he thinks it's better than his own, which also speaks volumes about him. For such a fairly light-hearted movie, I think the comedy aspect was lacking in a few places. There is a good running gag with coasters where Perry obsessively asks his daughter to use one and then stops a lap dance because the stripper puts a beer down on the table without one. Then his scene where he's meant to be flying off the rails is led by him slamming down a beer and saying, I don't need a coaster! Sadly though, the rest of the comedy is a bit... blah. There's not much of it that's cringy, it's just that none of the jokes really land. The absolute worst joke is when Perry mispronounces the name Rupert as Rupert. I mean, come on, Perry isn't dyslexic, he's not illiterate, he's not the smartest guy but he could read the word Rupert. Plus it's just shit writing, a five year old could write a better joke than that. There was a nice touch with one of the gags though, Perry says that throwing the TV out of the window during the party is not totally off the table, he then tries to do it when he has his bit meltdown. That's something that actually happened back in the 90s when Green Day was staying in a hotel. Trey Cool, Green Day's drummer, threw a TV out of the window and they all got kicked out. When we did the video for that song the night before... We got pretty hammered. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those it, were the drink. Those were the pre-sober days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It, yeah Trey, uh, Trey threw a TV out of a window. Oh, Did wow. you? Re that's real rock star shit. Yeah. 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 So that gag was a nice nod to the real Billy Joe Armstrong. I'm glad to say that I think the movie ends strongly. I've mentioned some nice scenes it has earlier, but I thought the ending was quite touching. Early on in the movie, Perry's mate in the guitar shop asks Perry to swap one of his current guitars for one that he wants in the shop. Perry declares there's no way he'd sell it as he's had that guitar his entire life. At the end of the movie, he trades it in to get his daughter a new guitar, since he smashed her other new one in the hotel freakout. I thought that was great. That's what solidified that Perry has moved on from his old life, which is sort of sad in itself, and is now handing down the gauntlet to his daughter. A similar thing that Kirk could have done may have been more punchy. It's have the daughter ask to play Perry's old guitar early on in the movie, and he doesn't let her, saying it's precious and that she shouldn't touch it or something like that. Then at the end, he presents her with the guitar and asks her to take good care of it. The aim of both scenes is the same, but I feel that might have a bit more weight to it. From a technical standpoint, I really love the soundtrack. All the tracks Billy Joe Armstrong wrote are solid, and I'll be listening to them along with Revolution Radio for a while to come. But the other tracks they used were also great. They fit into the film perfectly and were sort of reminiscent of the songs used in Scott Pilgrim. Most of those songs were written by Beck. The ones that weren't were all classics from the 70s and 80s. Even one of the songs Billy Joe wrote called Body Bag sounds like something straight out of Scott Pilgrim. Anything that alludes to Scott Pilgrim gets a big plus from me. I also appreciated that in scenes where Perry is playing music, they actually did it live. When he plays Devil's Kind at the beginning, it's clear that he's playing and singing live, as he also is when he sings Ordinary World. That's quite a ballsy move for a movie. Usually they just stick to a studio recording and mime it, which looks and sounds a bit stupid in my opinion. So whether they shot it totally live or just used a relatively unedited live recording like Green Day did in Demolicious, I don't know. But the live sounding song certainly added some sense of validity to Perry's character. I mean, if you're going to use one of the world's biggest rock stars, you may as well use his musical ability too, right? Overall, Ordinary World isn't a bad film, it's just poorly written with a take it or leave it story that lacks the emotional punches it's capable of. There is definitely a story written to be told in Ordinary World, it was screaming at me to come out, but the writing just wasn't there to unleash it. I don't think it's necessarily a directing error. Lee Kirk both wrote and directed the movie, but I think he has some really great scenes in the movie. He's definitely capable as a director. I just think the story really needed tightening, it needed to lose a lot of filler, flesh out the characters more, flesh out Perry's old days more, 
provide some better written comedy and more emotional punch. The scenes he did well are done quite well though so I can't completely write off the movie. The soundtrack is solid and it's a real big plus that they use live recordings of Billy for the music. I'm glad to say that I'm not totally put off seeing Billy Joe Armstrong in movies and I hope that if he were to do another, he chooses one with a better script. I don't think any of you will hate the movie unless you have some kind of vendetta against Billy Joe Armstrong, but check it out if you like coming of age stories. This is the midlife equivalent of those. I'm glad to say though that Lee Kirk's second movie doesn't paint him out to be a total American idiot. In the end, Ordinary World gets 2.5 frames out of 5. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Film Rant. Better.